Thank you, everybody. Uh, so as you mentioned, I'm a professor at SUTD, and my research is mainly about uh, digital music and all sorts of new applications that we can do uh, with digital music. So it's not really a surprise that music in its digital form is becoming ever more popular. If we look back at some of the sales numbers, we actually see that since last year, there were more revenue coming from digital music than there was from traditional record industry. If I would ask around here, I'm sure more than half of you listen to music on your phone as well. So um, maybe interesting to know also that Asia has about 14% of the digital revenue of the world, in digital music, that is. And we're expected to grow even more. So it's growing uh, another 15% in the next two years. So what does this all, what does all of this mean? Basically, there is a huge opportunity for new applications that use music. I'm sure all of you might use Spotify to listen to music, Last FM. Perhaps if you're in a bar and you hear a nice song, you use Shazam to see which song is playing. Right? So these new technologies that allow you to just hold up your phone and it will identify which song is playing in the room. These are the sort of applications that I work on. So there's a lot of other things. Spotify will, for instance, do intelligent music recommendation. So we'll take into account um, what you like and therefore predict what you may also like. In future forms, I'm sure there will also be research, for instance, on, oh, I detect that you're running right now. You probably want to listen to some active song. All of these types of AI applications uh, have become uh, very prominent these days. So I want to talk to you today about two applications. <coughs> Sorry. The first one is hit prediction. Can we see if a song can be a hit? or not, can we somehow automatically predict that? And then secondly, can we automatically generate new music or not? So let's look at the first one. Can we predict hits? First of all, why do we want to predict hits? Again, I look at some of the sales uh, numbers and I noticed that record company companies on average invest around between half a million and two million dollars just for bringing a new artist to the market. So if a record company would have some sort of tool that would help them determine people might like this or people might not like this, in addition to their experts, it might be very useful for them because there are huge cost savings involved in all of this. So um, I was thinking about this and I came across a paper uh, a paper written by Francois Pachet. He is the head of Sony Music in Paris. He actually recently moved to Spotify this year. And Francois Pachet said, uh, wrote this paper that said, hit song science is not yet a science. That was the title of the paper. So he tried feeding a model all these audio files and tr trying to let them predict if it could be a hit or not, and it failed. So I was intrigued by this and I thought, can't we try it some other way? Perhaps it would work if we use a more advanced model or whatever. Um, so I did this research and I started in 2013. So to start with, I constrained myself to one particular genre. Oh, sorry. Uh, because I thought, well, the rules that make a hit song in a rock song or a pop song or a dance song might be very different. So the first thing I did was constrain myself to one genre. And we looked at dance songs. Um, where do we get these dance songs? From the internet listings. This is a picture from billboard.com. They, ke they keep like weekly lists of the hit songs. And they keep a really large record. So we, we were able to get songs that go back all the way to 1985. So we collected about 30 years worth of data. And from all of these songs, we knew which ones were hit songs. Let's say top 10 hits. A little bit more of a challenge 
is finding data of bad songs. So right. they're not really lists of bad songs out there. <coughs> Somebody should do that. It would make my work easier. Uh, but for now, we just chose to work with songs that were listed really low. So we took songs that never reached over top 30. Mm -hmm. So that gives us some indication of what makes one song better than the other. Um, so we have all these MP3s. So we got over 100 audio features from them. Based on these features, we thought, let's have a look and see what we can see, the naked eye. First, we looked at duration of songs from 1985 till now. So we, you see the line goes down. That means typically songs seem to be shorter. Maybe not surprising given our attention deficit these days. Um, we also noticed that the tempo of the song seems to go faster. If, if you ask my grandmother, most likely, she will very much agree, because she's always talking about this. Songs are too fast. Um, if you look at loudness, <laughs> another thing, you, you see that songs get more loud. Like, there's a lot more going on in the songs. So we have a lot more charts available, but these are kind of the ones that stuck out, stood out. Looking at this, we notice that songs evolve over time. Right? So I shouldn't be using data from 1985 to train what would be a hit today, because it will be different. So we used only our data from the last two years. And we built some hits, uh, some classifier models. And we noticed that we could reach up to 80% accuracy if we just use audio features to try to predict this just quite a, a good result. So the challenges with this model is that it's very good at identifying hits, but hit non-hits are often still misclassified. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we'll be working on further. We made this little tool available uh, on the internet so you could upload your MP3 and just get your percentage of uh, hit out of there. Unfortunately, due to some changes in the API, it's not working right now, but I'm hoping to get it up really soon, so you should check the website uh, shortly again. Now we're thinking, audio features is good. Imagine I write a really good hit song tomorrow. That's not a guarantee that it will actually become a hit, right? Because there's a lot more to it. That's why we had a look at the influence of social media on hit songs. There are these people, if you look at economics theory, there are these people called trendsetters or early adopters. And basically, they're the people that have some sort of sixth sense. So they manage to pick out the songs. And if they listen to songs, their peers and other people will follow them and also start listening to their songs, these songs. So Nowadays, we can just see what everybody listens to. Uh, so we scraped or we used the official API of Last.fm, and we got listening behavior of the 2,000 most active users of Last.fm over the last seven years. So we, we recorded what they were listening to every day. And it resulted in a total of over 8,000 hits and 7,000 non-hits. So it's a lot of data for us to process. So every week we try to see the song that is not a hit, will it be a hit next week or not? And we managed to, using similar techniques, we managed to get really high accuracy rates of up to 95%. So even more important than the audio is who is actually listening to your song. So those first people who hear your song that spread it um, across their network. So I thought that was a very interesting result. So there's a lot uh, that I want to do on this model still and make it even better, more accurate. We haven't looked at lyrics, for instance. Does it make a difference what the lyrics are about? Are they happy? Are they sad? Um, we'll try different genres as well. And in the end, we want to make this a tool that will be available for 
people like you, industry people, who want to explore the quality of a song. Right. So, I'll move on to our second topic, which is on generating music. Does anybody know this lady? Yeah, <laughs> Ada. So it actually says on the slide, <laughs> Ada Loveless. Ada Loveless, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's kind of seen as the world's first programmer. Right? And Ada, I put a picture of the computer that she pro... Oh, this is not a, a pointer, sorry. <laughs> ah, I put a picture of the uh, computer or engine, it was called the analytical engine, that she programmed uh, punch cards for. Uh, back in 1840, and she already then was talking about how computers might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music. So back when the very first computer was conceptualized, people were already thinking, well, this machine, maybe we can use it to compose music. So that's very interesting. It wasn't until the 1950s that songs were actually composed. The first piece made on a computer called the Iliac Suite, that one was composed uh, by two scientists called Le Yaren and Hiller. And both of them used statistical models, used the Iliac computer, which is also depicted, uh, depicted on the picture here, to compose a string quartet. Now it's a string quartet, so you think four instruments at the same time, but actually we always only hear one instrument at one time, so it's still kind of monophonic. But let you listen to this piece. <laughs> It goes on for a while. Um, it's definitely impressive of them to manage to compose this using that uh, very basic computer. Uh, however, there's still a lot of work to be done on this piece. Right? If I may ask, is there anybody here who has a music generation app on their phone? One person, that's great. <laughs> that's the first time this has happened. <laughs> Um, so it's great, but why does the majority of you not listen to music gen computer generated music? Well, they have been developing this since the 50s, so what's still missing here? And if you ask me, there's still two challenges. So it's that um, whenever we have a song that sticks to our mind, it's because there's this repetitive theme, something that really that you commit to memory. And a lot of these computer-generated systems don't have that. So there's, this is great in the short term, but there's no longer term structure. And secondly, I think music is very much related to emotions. And emotions are still something that is hard to capture for machines. Uh, so I think these two things are the challenges that computer uh, music people should focus on. And I want to show you one of my projects that we try to work on these two aspects of uh, the generated music. And the first is the emotion aspect. What we did was, well, first of all, it's really important to capture a sort of tension or emotion in music, especially if you want to try to generate music that fits, let's say, a video, video game. Maybe you want some background music for your YouTube video. If you need any of this, then you need to take into account tensions that happen on the screen. You're playing a game, you're about to jump for the flag in Mario and there's joyful music. Right. So we try to capture this using a model for tonal tension. Okay. I'm not going to go into the details and mathematics of how we did this, but we used a mu music theory inspired model that basically shows or represents notes in three dimension. Okay. So for instance, this picture on the top left shows us 
the Tristan chord. Tristan chord is a very famous tense chord. It's a chord uh, that was first used in the opera Tristan and Isolde. And each time the character Tristan enters the stage, this chord is played. So to just to kind of indicate the tension. If we represent it in our 3D model, we see that it, the blue dots, we see that they're very stretched out. So, and that will translate to a higher tension in our model because they're kind of dissonant notes. So what our software does is you enter the score and whenever your chord or attention appears, there's this big ribbon across it. So let me play you this fragment where we have the Tristan chord at the beginning of the third bar. So it's quite apparent when there's this tension occurring, we can capture it. So that's a first thing. The, our second challenge was that we needed to capture long-term structure. So what we did is um, we use a piece, we kind of cheat, we use an existing piece and we're going to detect all of the patterns and long-term structures. And then we can use that as a sort of template. So, much like you see here, if the dots are all notes, pitch heights moving over time, then we try to kind of capture where the patterns occur. Here's an example of how the compression algorithm that we used worked. So, in this short piece of music, there are two big themes. You see here, the top, let me just show you. This top sequence occurs almost identical here, but it's transposed. Same here, this descending sequence of notes appears again here. Right. So the pattern detection algorithm, which is called Koziatek, um, developed by Professor Meredith in Denmark, he, his algorithm is able to detect these patterns. You see the red pattern here represents these notes and it comes back here. Let me, um, let me play the piece for you so you can imagine it a little bit better. It's all these repeating structures that our brain really likes. So what happens if we put this together? We use some sort of optimization algorithm that I won't go into detail. Uh, and we used a template piece, and basically detected the patterns, detected the tension, and generated a new piece with this. You may all be familiar with this song. I'll play you the template piece we used. So you notice in the last part where the sharp comes in, the tension is a little bit higher. You see that because of the colored ribbon. So we detected the patterns, we detected the tension, and then we erased all of the pitches. And we generated new pitches, but constrained them to fit the pattern. Right? Obviously, there's a hint of the original piece in there, but it's also a new piece. So I'll let you listen to the resulting piece. So, 
some strange things are happening with people's expectations here because you, you know the original piece. Um, yeah, so let me see. Yeah. I think I just want to conclude here. We have a lot of other generated pieces and uh, my collaborator, Professor Elaine Chu, uh, she's a great pianist and she's performing them around the world a little bit. Um, if you're interested in more pieces, you can go to my website, the name's on the last slide, and listen to a few of our videos that we have on there. But in conclusion, I hope that uh, you find this a very interesting approach. We're definitely still working on improving it because, well, as I said earlier, we're kind of cheating using a template. So in the next, let's say in the next part of our research, we want to generate the template so we don't need to be uh, reliant on uh, an existing piece anymore. And we hope to be able to do that using some neural networks and some uh, pattern generation techniques. So I think we can conclude that machine learning really brings a lot of opportunities to the field of digital music and that I've just touched two applications here, music generation and hit prediction but there are really a lot of other things. We have a project on automatically generating fingerings for piano sheet music. So if you're a student player, you don't know how, you know, how to best put your fingers, our algorithm can generate that for you. Um, we can detect chords from audio files. If you're learning to play the guitar and you can't hear which chord is being played, but you want to learn it, algorithms can do that for you. There's really a lot going on in this field and I hope to have spurred your interest with this talk. Thank you very much.